Hello and welcome to Skeptics in the Pub. We are back after our exciting jolly to Manchester. Um, we all had a fantastic time at QED. Uh, particularly, I want to say thank you to everyone that was involved in organising the Skeptic Camp part thing. That was a fantastic day. Um, quickly, who we are. Uh, we are the Skeptics in the Pub online. We are a bunch of people that used to meet in pubs from Manchester to Munich. Not Moscow anymore. Mos Manchester to Mo Munich. And because the COVID thing happened, we started meeting online. But it's worth noting that now... People are meeting back in in face to face environments again. Your local skeptics in the pub may well have an event. Look on our website sitp.online and see if you can find some information about your local face to face skeptics in an actual pub. Um, but while the in person thing is wonderful, I also want to say thank you very much to everyone that was involved in this Skeptic in the Pub online part because um, you all did a fantastic job. You helped us raise enough money that we could send eight people to the QED conference in Manchester and also pay £533 to the QED official charity of Fair Share who helped make sure that no food is wasted while anyone can go hungry. So each and every one of you that did anything towards that is an astonishing astonishingly fantastic person and we are ridiculously grateful for what you've done for that thank you so much um but we're back from qed now and we're back to our fortnightly meetings here online so we meet on the second and the fourth thursday of every month and we have a talk it can be a talk of anything ranging from physics to i don't know other stuff who cares about that? But no, there's lots of fascinating stuff that we can talk about. Um, but we want you to be involved in this. So we have the Twitch chat to the side there. Chat to your people there. Ask questions in there. Have a conversation in there. But if you want to ask a question specifically to our speakers, we have sitp.online forward slash ask. There we can go to a website known as Slido. You can ask your questions. If you don't have a question you particularly want to ask, upvote other people's questions um we all know that igor's going to get the question at the top of the list anyway but upvote other people help them get but slightly beneath igor's limit um but back to today's specific talk today we're going to be talking about what's been happening out there in space there's been a just wonderful space telescope put out there it's it's like hubble but apparently much much better so we're going to learn what that has done we're going to learn the science that has come out of that because they're already it's only been up there a couple of months i believe and they're already getting really interesting science i looked at some of these uh, google scholar papers from our speaker today and the science that's coming out of this is already just changing what we know about the universe and it's it's genuinely a deeply fascinating thing um so I'll now introduce our speaker today. Uh, we are talking to Emma. Emma is uh, an STFC Web Fellow. That means she gets paid money to do actual science with the data that comes off this brand new telescope that we've stuck out in space. But it also is important for her that she takes this science that she's doing and gives it to the world. So she's a science educator, a science communicator. Um, she has worked in Edinburgh, Paris and Cambridge. She's now work based at the University of Hertfordshire, which is just down the road from where I am. So hello down there. And she's been working to bring the web data and the web information to the public with an exhibition of the images at various places that are open to the public. So it is with an absolute pleasure that I'd love you all now to go crazy in the chat, do the chat emojis, do the applause, do the woo, do the popping things that you can do in the emojis and please welcome our host our guest today dr emma curtis lake oh thank you so much so yeah wonderful introduction uh you've explained it all basically i want to bring science to you guys um you'll see a qr code here on my screen um that's kind of for later but it was also just there so that you know that it's coming. It's just really helpful for me to gather feedback so that I can keep getting better at this talking thing. 
But let's just start with the thing. We're talking about this telescope, James Webb Space Telescope. It was launched on 25th of December last year, so let's start there. This is just a highlights video. Attention for the count final. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, unité. And we have the start. Decollage, liftoff from a tropical rainforest to the edge of time itself. James Webb begins a voyage back to the birth of the universe. So that's an animation, not a real thing, obviously. Separation Web Space Telescope. But this actually is the real telescope. So we got to really see it as it was sent off on its journey. And we're just about to see the very first deployment where its solar panel opened. And at that point we knew it had power and we knew that it was going to start unfolding. So that thing there looks very different from what it looks like now. And it is <laughs> the largest telescope ever to be launched into space. This is it in comparison to another much loved space telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope. I sort of spent my teenage years poring over images of this thinking, oh, I wonder what it'd be like to be an astrophysicist. Um, and it's still taking amazing pictures today. This is the James Webb Space Telescope, and here's a little person here for scale. So that mirror is 6.5 meters in diameter. This thing here is a sun shield around the size of a tennis court, and it's made of um, five layers of a very thin, specially engineered fabric, and it was all folded up to get into the rocket. Um, so the sides of the mirror were folded in, this secondary mirror was folded up, the sides were sort of squished in and then folded up, and so this is the first time we've got a mirror into space that's bigger than the size of the rocket that took it up there. So that's kind of an exciting beginning. Now, I haven't got a video for you of its deployment. It then had to unfold as it took a journey to a million miles away to where it is now, which is called the second Lagrange point. So this is a special point in space where as it goes around the sun, because it's orbiting the sun, not the Earth, uh, normally if the, a body is further away from the sun than we are, it would start to trail behind. But this point is special because the gravity from the Earth allows it to keep up. So it doesn't need a lot of extra energy to keep up with it. That makes it easier to communicate with because it's not too far away. It's only a million miles away. Uh, but that was also let it cool down because um, the mirror here and the instruments on the back of that are always shielded from the light and the heat from the Earth and the sun behind. And that's allowed it to get really, really cold. It's Without any extra help, it got down to minus 223 degrees Celsius, and then that's 50 Kelvin. And then with a little bit of passive cooling, so no cryogen or anything, it got a little bit colder to 39 Kelvin around about. And there's one instrument on board that needs to be much colder, needed some help with some cryogen, and that's at 7 Kelvin or minus 266 degrees Celsius. That's almost as cold as you can get. And the reason it needs to be so cold is because we're looking um, in the infrared wavelength. So this is the whole of the electromagnetic spectrum going from gamma rays, x-rays, which we use to sort of see through our bodies, see our bones, all the way to the radio, which we use to communicate with each other. And in fact, the radio is how images are sent back to Earth from this telescope. And it's peering at the universe in uh, this region of the electromagnetic spectrum, whereas this is the tiny region that our eyes are sensitive to, invisible. And this is what Hubble could see. 
And so infrared, you can kind of think of as heat wavelengths. It's the only other part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we are actually directly sensitive to. We have sensors that, um, receptors that can uh, feel it in the form of heat. And so I sometimes call it heat wavelengths. And to be able to see um, in the infrared, your instruments need to be colder than the things that you're looking at, because otherwise you just see, you'd see a glow from your instruments, you'd see the heat of them themselves. And if our eyes were sensitive to the infrared instead of the visible, instead of picking out different colors, we'd be picking out different temperatures. So that's some very different information. So this is a little video from an infrared camera. If you come along to any of our sort of open days in Bayfordry, if you live nearby, we have an infrared camera we can show you. And uh, it'll give you information like whose no noses are cold and whose glasses are cold because I've been outside and what's very warm, etc. And as astrophysicists, we just like getting extra information about anything that we see. It helps us build a picture of what's going on. But why did we need to launch it into space? So this is a really large mirror, a large telescope. That's a huge collecting area, which will allow us to see faint things. But it would clearly be much easier to build a huge mirror on Earth. In fact, we've already built much bigger mirrors for huge telescopes on Earth. And we're planning now a 35 meter diameter telescope or a 40 diameter meter um, telescope. Uh, but the thing is, they will not be able to see the universe in the infrared because the Earth's atmosphere gets in the way. It blocks a lot of the light. It's also just very warm around here. So how would you cool it? How would you keep it cold enough um, while also being allow it, allowing it to be open so it could look up? But the most important thing is that also the atmosphere is getting in the way. So we built this huge telescope. It's looking in the infrared. Why? Why was it so important that we build this telescope, put it into space and look into the infrared? So there's some things about this telescope you should know. First off, it's incredibly expensive, $10 billion. Second off, it's taken decades and hundreds of people to build. And there's quite a few astronomy projects that had to kind of be pushed and put on hold because it's been so expensive. And yet many, many astronomers would say it's the most important thing that we've been waiting for. So one of the reasons we wanna look in the infrared is that we can peer through dust and even see it. So what I have here are three different images of our galaxy, the Milky Way. And in the bottom is the optical that we would see with our eyes. And um, the view is mostly like what you would get if you were lucky enough to have looked up at dark skies from Australia. Because in, actually in Australia, you're looking directly into the center of the galaxy and it looks completely different and gorgeous. And you can actually see with the naked eye sometimes that there are these dark patches that sort of um, go through the, the milky smear, the Milky Way across the sky. And those dark patches are not an absence of stars. If you're looking towards the center of our galaxy, that's where more stars are. It's just that there's dust blocking the light from getting to us. But if we go into the near infrared, that's the bit that's closest to the optical, we see through it and we see the stars behind it. So it's exactly the same patch of sky, but viewed at um, in near infrared. And then if we go to to slightly longer wavelengths to the mid infrared, then we're actually starting to see a glow from the dust itself. So this dust is a little bit warm. I mean, dust in general is very cold. So we're looking at cold things in the infrared um, generally, um, but uh, it's been warmed in the plane of the galaxy and we can see its glow. So this takes us to one of the images that was released in uh, July this year. So it was launched in December, it spent about a month unfolding, and then it spent about five months um, aligning and focusing. So it was a very long wait and with just some little snippets to know you know, how good is it? And then in July, they planned this big splash of images. They were like, right, we're going to look at some beautiful things in the sky and we're going to release them as this sort of package. 
And this gorgeous one here is called the Cosmic Cliffs. It's looking at a star forming region within our galaxy. It's actually a very small patch of a much larger cloud. So you can see here, it's just taking this tiny little region and that's what we've looked at with JWST. But this whole star forming cloud is a much bigger area and you can see some bubbles here where some newly formed stars are, they formed recently and they have some very energetic winds and they're blowing out uh, bubbles in this gas they're clearing the gas and the dust away and what we have in our cosmic eclipse image is that we're just on the edge of one of these bubbles so that means that these new stars are way off the top of the image here and you can even pick out like there's some evaporation from the cloud that's coming off it and um, thanks to um, JWST, we're able to see through the dust a little bit. So I have a comparison for you with Hubble. So Hubble see, appeared at this patch of sky. You can see there's a cute little bubble there from a smaller star that's just formed. But we see barely any stars in here. And yet, this is exactly the type of region where new stars are forming so if we want to see stars in the earliest moments of their lives, we want to peer through the gas and dust that enshrouds them in their birth clouds. And that's what we get to do here with uh, JWST. And I couldn't tell you which ones of these stars are within the cloud and which ones are behind it. It's not my area of science, but that's what people are figuring out now. And they just released another couple of images, which um, is another similar region. So these are uh, the pillars of creation. And they released this one, I think, just a few weeks ago, just before um, Halloween. And I thought that their color palette was wonderful. It just looked very spooky, right? And again, um, it's, a, it's probably be longer since stars started forming because more of the gas and dust has been cleared away and we've just got these sort of dense regions where it still hasn't been cleared away yet and I saw someone put a distance bar on here which was really cool so about here to here is about the distance from us to our closest star so these distances are vast and this makes a lot of sense because our sun and our closest star will have formed in huge clouds like this. They would have formed in the same type of structure in the same cloud. Now to explain to you these two different images, this one looks very similar. It's taken with the same instrument as the, the image I showed you before. This one is taken at longer wavelengths. So I said you could peer through dust and then even see it at longer wavelengths. And this one is from MIRI, that instrument that had to be cooled down to seven Kelvin to be able to see really cold things. Um, and so we have this sort of uh, spooky, smoky like texture. In Hubble, what we were just getting is that the dust was blocking the light, it was kind of getting in the way, and now we actually see the structure of the gas and dust in this stellar nursery. So that's stellar birth, and now we're going to go all the way to the end of the stellar life cycle to stellar death. And this is, um, it's called a planetary nebula, but it's actually nothing to do with planets. I think apparently when they first found ones like these, they thought maybe it was the beginnings of a planetary system around a star. But actually, it's the death throes of a dying star. So there are two stars in the middle here. They're in a binary system, so they've lived their whole lives sort of orbiting around each other. And the fainter one here is the one which is basically dead. It ran out of fuel it stopped um, any nuclear fusion. And over the course of thousands of years, it ejected its outer layers into 
the cosmos and we can see the sort of ripples there and it provides us with a timeline so the further out the material is the earlier in the death throes it was um, sent out into space and there's something um, intriguing about these images um, and that was that the fact that we're seeing it brighter in here, this is again from Miri, this is from Nearcam. Um, we're seeing it in here. We tend to see dust emission itself from Miri. And so what it looks like is that it's enshrouded in dust in material, but it should have finished ejecting its outer layers. So there's a bit of a puzzle there. I haven't followed up on this since the image was released. I don't know if they've solved this puzzle, but uh, what they were suggesting was potentially its companion might be reaching the stage where it's starting to um, release some of its outer layer or, it, or at least just sort of expanded enough that some of its outer atmosphere can start to accrete onto the other star. And actually, depending on the masses, if you have exactly the right masses, that could end up in a supernova explosion. And the final thing I like to point out from this one is this thing here. This is nothing to do with this nebula within our own galaxy. This is a galaxy in its own right. It's just kind of photobombing and there are just galaxies everywhere in these images. So um, there are three webfellows in all, one other webfellow looks at things within our galaxy and she sent out a message on Twitter saying, huh, you know, does, does anyone know how distant this galaxy would be if it looked like this? And I was like, oh, you've got some interesting things. Can I look at your data? She doesn't care about them, but I do. And they're just everywhere. So when they said they were going to release the pictures from uh, the Southern Ring Nebula, I went to Hubble to look at what it looked like. And this is the Hubble image that so kind of looks a little bit eerie in a way. Um, but I looked at that and I have to admit, I said I was surprised that this would be one of their targets because it didn't look that interesting to me. <laughs> Compared to other nebula that we have in our galaxy, this one is one of the more boring ones. And yet when we look at the level of detail in this image with the ripples and also you can see sort of almost like glory rays where where light from the star is able to pierce through um holes in the gas and dust um i think it's it, it's wonderful and stunning and yeah it was a good choice so that's one reason it's kind of two, it's peering through dust and seeing it. And that can tell us a lot about the beginning and end points of stellar life. Another reason why we want to look at the infrared is because it's great for investigating planets, in particular ones outside our own solar system, which we call exoplanets. So this particular image is a Hubble image. It uh, looks really weird. <laughs> I'll explain it in a moment. But first off, the point about infrared with planets is our planet is not emitting visible light. We don't have to, you know, put on our sunglasses to look down at the ground necessarily. It's reflecting light as, at us from the sun, but it's not emitting it. However, it is warm. So it is emitting infrared radiation. So we can see the emission from the planets themselves by going into the infrared. So back to this image that looks a bit like a cat's eye. This thing in the middle is where they've um, blocked the light of the central star so that otherwise it would have been too much scattered light in the image, you wouldn't be able to see fainter details. It's called a coronagraph. And then this thing here is the little potential planet. And they tracked it over more than a decade, in fact and they could see its uh, motion. So it was going around sort of the inner edge of this ring, which is a dust ring, which they think was being entrained because of this planet. So anything 
within the orbit of this planet could fall into the star, but everything out of it was kind of kept there by the uh, gravitational effects of the planet. However, if you were to look up this system, you would see that later they tra kept tracking it and it seemed to get maybe bigger and then disappear. So maybe it wasn't a fully fledged planet. Maybe this was a very um, kind of violent system. You can have um, collisions and uh, disrupt large structures in the early um, early stages of planet building around stars. So this planet, they think, uh, is no longer sort of big enough to see it or anything else. And it's probably just been um, completely pulled apart in a collision. However, this is the first direct image of an exoplanet taken by JWST. And this is one of the huge, huge driving factors behind having a really large infrared telescope. Where this star is, is where the parent star is. And then we're taking it in different wavelengths. So it's the same thing. The reason it looks different shapes, that's just kind of artifacts from the imaging. It's not, it's not anything different about the object it, itself. So this system is called HIP 65426b. I always have to read that out. It's, they think, around six to 12 times the mass of Jupiter, but very young, around 15 to 20 million years old. And that type of information is the only type you can only really get when you're getting the um, emission from the planet itself to understand um, its properties. So that's really, really young compared to our 4.5 billion year old Earth. But we can do even more with JWST than just getting some blurry images of things. This was one of the ones that came out in the July release. And it was, I was quite impressed that they put out a spectrum. So it's where you take the light, you split it up. Um, and it's a spectrum of an exoplanet atmosphere. And to describe more about how they uh, make this, I've found a really nice YouTube video. So let's hope that my internet will allow me to show it. Yeah. <laughs> how do we learn about a planet's atmosphere? How do we know what's in the atmosphere of an exoplanet? The majority of known exoplanets have been discovered because they partially block the light of their host star. This is called a transit. During a transit, some of the star's light travels through the planet's atmosphere and gets absorbed. The light that survives carries information about the planet across light years of space where it reaches our telescopes. However, the planet is very small relative to the star, so it is still very difficult to detect, which is why we need a big telescope to be sure to capture this tiny bit of light. So how do we use a telescope to read transit light? Stars emit light at many wavelengths. Like a prism makes a rainbow, we can separate light into its separate wavelengths. This is called a spectrum. Visible light appears to our eyes as the colors of the rainbow, but beyond visible light, there are many wavelengths we cannot see. Now back to the transiting planet. As light is traveling through the planet's atmosphere, some wavelengths get absorbed. Which wavelengths get absorbed depends on which molecules are in the planet's atmosphere. For example, carbon monoxide molecules will capture different wavelengths than water vapor molecules. So when we look at that planet in front of the star, some of the wavelengths of the starlight will be missing, depending on which molecules are in the atmosphere of the planet. Learning about the atmospheres of other worlds is how we identify those that could potentially support life, bringing us another step closer to answering one of humanity's oldest questions. Are we alone? So if we go back to this spectrum, what the, it shows for the first time for this exoplanet is that it has clouds of water vapor in the atmosphere. That's what these kind of bumps are showing. Which may sound promising for life, 
But when I tell you more about this planetary system, you'll realize that it really isn't, not at, at least not for life that we as we know it. So this system, it's got one of those uh, fun names, WASP-96b. It's 22 times closer to its star than we are to our sun. And it orbits it once every 3.5 days. And it's a gas giant. So it's got no solid ground, but it does have water in its atmosphere. So not hosting life as we know it, but this was <laughs> all of these images and data that came out in July were, I think, taken over a two week time period. So the fact that they could get this means that this was easy for JWST. Um, and the point is to push it to smaller planets further away from their star, which are more likely to be within a habitable zone, to be rocky and to possibly harbour life. So they will be able to look for traces of carbon dioxide, methane, water, carbon monoxide, things that are, you know, poisonous to life as we know it. Um, and we really will be searching for signs of life, of habitability in exoplanets. So that's a huge step forward. And incredibly exciting, I will admit, but I don't work on hexaplanets. <laughs> so I'm now going to take you outside of our galaxy completely. We're going to go on a bit more of a journey and we're going to uh, go for the third reason why we look at the infrared. And that's to be able to probe the history of the universe. And that requires a little bit of explanation. So it starts with the simple yet astounding fact that light has a finite speed. And this video here shows in real time how long it takes light to travel from the moon to the Earth. So it takes around 1.255 seconds. So we see the moon as it was around 1.255 seconds ago. Now, you may know it takes about seven minutes for a light to travel from the sun to the Earth. So we see the sun as it was seven minutes ago. And the further away something is, the longer it takes light to reach us. And that means the further away something is, the long, longer and back in time we see it. And in a sense, that means that every single telescope is a time machine. And that doesn't tell us why we need to go to the infrared. For that, we need more information. So around 100 years ago, this man, Edwin Hubble, who the Hubble Space Telescope was named after, showed that the further away something is, the faster it's moving away from us. So this is the expansion of the universe. Uh, it's not because we're in a special place and everything's moving away from us. Any other observer on another galaxy should look up at the sky and see the same thing. So the further away something is, the faster it's moving away from us. And that does something special to the light, which you may know of as the Doppler effect. So in a day-to-day -day life, we can actually experience the Doppler effect in a very uh, direct way. Um, of the change in pitch of a siren as it comes past. I've heard that explanation so many times. And yet when I actually pay attention to it in, you know, when it actually happens and you hear it, it's so distinct. So I really do invite you, even if, you know, you, you've heard it before next time, really just listen to that because it's very, very obvious. So what's happening is when something's moving towards you, it squishes up the light. So, so um, with sound, the sound waves, it squishes them up, moves it to higher frequency. With light, it squishes everything up, and that moves it into the blue part of the spectrum, and we call it a blue shift. If something's moving away from you for sound, it's sort of spreading everything out. That means you go, have um, a lower pitch, and for light, it gets shifted into the red, and it's called a red shift. And if you know by how much it's shifted, you actually know how fast something is moving away from you. So the further away something is, the longer it takes the light to reach us. But also the further away something is, the faster it's moving away from us 
and the more its light is shifted into red wavelengths. And so it is actually possible, if we take the spectrum of a galaxy, for us to shift all of the light out of what Hubble could see. And only Webb would be able to see it. So Webb can see further back in time than Hubble. So we're going to end our journey there, but before that, let we will take a few interesting stops on the way. This is a beautiful group of galaxies called Stefan's Quintet. And given its name, you may guess that there are five big galaxies there. There's obviously hundreds of galaxies behind it if you sit and stare. And to pick them out, there's one here, one here, one here, and there are actually two here. And they're in the final stages of merging. Now, for, from this system, these four galaxies are very close to each other, and it has taken 300 million years for the light to reach us. So when the light left those galaxies, it was certainly before um, humans were on the Earth, it was before dinosaurs were on the Earth, apparently there were sharks and crocodiles, and there was also, um, Britain was much closer to Greenland and Africa because we have the supercontinent of Pangaea. So the Earth looked very, very different when the light from these galaxies started its journey. This galaxy, which looks very different, it's only taken around 40 million years for the light to reach us. And the reason it looks so different is really just because it's closer and we can see more details. So it's much smaller than these guys, which are so far away. And we can start to sort of see individual star forming regions. So that's why this one looks grainy and these ones look smooth. They're just much further away and we can see less of the details. Now, what we see is that there's this um, filamentary structure in between these galaxies. So all three of them are interacting in the kind of cosmic dance in space and they're flinging out gas into the intervening medium, and that makes the perfect um, regions for new stars to form. And if we look at the Hubble image, you'll see that this whole region here, there was maybe indications that something was going on, but just as in our own galaxy, there's so much dust there that it was very hard to see the new stars for being formed. So the power of Webb is to peer through that ga uh, gas and dust and see where new stars are forming. And these are, if you think about it, these are forming way, way outside their, their galaxies. It's a completely different kind of environment. The next stop is this guy, which is just fun. <laughs> called the Cartwheel Galaxy. And what we think happened here is there was a spiral galaxy just minding its own business. And then probably this guy came along and just shot right through it like an, um, an arrow going through. And that caused a shock wave, which um, spread out from this galaxy. And because the spiral galaxies, they all pretty much are rotating, it continued to rotate. And you can see that it's, um, been kind of wrapping these structures um, around the central core. So this one, it's not so much further away than Stefan's Quintet. Uh, it's taken around 500 million years for the light to reach us. So there, were, there was still life on Earth. Um, and I found something that suggested that there were uh, fossils from this time on land, like footprints from tiny animals, well, not that tiny, apparently lobster-sized centipede-like animals. This is from Wikipedia, so I mean, I don't know enough to know if this is <laughs> this is true, but um, I like that fact and still to show us. But very much, you know, the, the Earth had formed by the time the light had left us. If we were to ask how far back in time can we see with Hubble, how far back in time from Web C. Um, I'm going to tell you that with the aid of a clock, a special clock. 
So if we start from the top and go around it, we're going to go back in time all the way to the beginning of the universe in the Big Bang, 13.8 billion years ago. And there are some markers here. There's the first dark blue segment. Uh, that's the beginning of humans, any type of humans that we know of on Earth, um, 2.8 million years ago. If we go back uh, around a third of the age of the universe, we have the formation of the Earth and not long before it, the solar system. That's 4.5 billion years ago. And then if we go all the way back round to around 13.6 billion years ago, we have one estimate for the formation of the Milky Way, our own galaxy. And this hand here is showing us how far back in time Hubble can see. So it's pretty far. <laughs> it can't see any further back than 13.4 billion years ago which is just 400 million years after the Big Bang, which is pretty good, right? It's done pretty well, and it's told us tons about galaxies and how they've been forming in the universe since very, very early times. Why do we care so much about this bit? Because this is another huge driving factor behind us having an infrared telescope in space, being able to see back further in time than Hubble. And to explain that, I'm going to show you a different view of the history of the universe. If we start at the Big Bang, go all the way to the present day. Now those early times, it's all been stretched out to make it look more important. And after the Big Bang, we have a period of rapid inflation. And then we get to a point uh, where we get emission called the cosmic microwave background which is super cool, super interesting. But after that, you know, there's not much going on, honestly. There's some um, hydrogen, some helium. We think there's dark matter and gravity, maybe some smatterings. Well, some smatterings of beryllium and lithium. And that's about it. So no stars, no galaxies. We kind of call it the dark ages and it's a little bit boring. But gravity is doing its job. And where there are just tiny fluctuations, where it's just slightly denser, gravity will pull matter onto these regions and they'll get denser and denser and sparser regions will get sparser and sparser. And it takes some time and we don't know how long before some regions of space get hot enough and dense enough to ignite hydrogen fusion and give us our very first generation of stars. And we think these stars are really different compared to our sun. We think maybe like 500 or 1,000 suns were. So really big. We think that they run through their fuel very quickly. And we think they probably die in massive explosions, in supernova explosions. But we haven't been able to see them yet. So Hubble has been able to see up to about here. This is the marker. And Webb, with NearCam, that instrument that was taking the beautiful yellowy and blue images, um, can see to within 17 million years after the Big Bang, which we think that's enough time that we should be able to see these stars if we're lucky. It's not about seeing far enough back in time now, it's about whether how long do we have to sit and stare before we can see these things that are so far away that they'll be faint. And we also have to be lucky if they um, only live for a short period of time and as soon as they explode they spew out heavier elements like carbon, nitro um, nitrogen and oxygen into the surrounding medium then uh, we have to be lucky to catch the moment before that happens. But we will be looking for them. But I've seen a lot of the early universe, and so I can give you a little tiny overview of some of the things it's found and what Webb um, is doing better, not just will do better. And that takes us to my favourite patch of sky. This is called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. It's quite a famous patch of sky. It's tiny, um, but Hubble stared at it for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours. And in this patch of sky, there's about 10,000 galaxies in that image. 
And when we take an image of a patch of sky, we don't sort of just get to choose at what epoch or how far back in time we want to see. We see everything. So we see things that are close to us where the light hasn't taken too long to reach us. And we think, see things that are very distant and it's taken a very long time to reach us. And if we want to find the mo those most distant ones, it's a bit like a needle in a haystack. And from this patch of sky, when we revisited it in 2012, we found only seven likely candidates inhabiting the universe when it was less than 600 million years old. So they're here, they're these blobs, they're a little bit uninteresting, they're so far away, we can't get sort of good detail of what they look like. In fact, this one here, um, there's three images of the same spot just to say that show that it shows up just at the edge of what Hubble could see, which meant that either it was the most distant galaxy that we could see with Hubble, or maybe it was a low redshift interloper masquerading as a high redshift galaxy. And we have information on this now. Um, there was a paper just released showing that with NIRCAM, um, there's evidence that it's high redshift. It's not, um, it's not a low redshift interloper. And so what we'll be able to do with Webb, the thing to remember, right, what took Hubble hundreds of hours, Webb can do in tens of hours. So this is the same patch of sky, and this is simulated data of the patch of sky and what the team that I'm working on should would have achieved, we thought, from simulated data. So actually we've got this data now, but I'm not allowed to show you. And I would say that it's it's not far off <laughs> what we could see. So if you've got a good black screen and you peer in, you see that there's lots more faint uh, galaxies in the uh, blank regions. There's lots of sort of small red smudges and that's what we would expect um, where we'd be expecting to pick out more objects than Hubble would have found. So that means that Webb um, is already and will find many, many more galaxies within the very early universe just because they're faint. But Webb is so much better at seeing faint things thanks to its huge mirror and um, it can see further back in time than Hubble can. So now we're going to go to the um, fifth and final image that was released in July. At that time, this was the deepest infrared image of the sky. And it was released um, because they they did like a, a meeting with the president of the United States the day before they were going to release these images. And they were just going to release the one at the time. And honestly, the, it was terrible. I was sat there with my family. On a family holiday, we were ready, we were going to watch it. And then it was delayed. And they were like, it's going to be an hour. So some people toddled off to bed because it was late in the evening. And it kept getting delayed, kept getting delayed. People kept going back up. And then by the end of the wait, when they finally released it, I had one member of family still sitting next to me. And she stayed up the whole time. So before I explain what's in this image there are two short stories I want to tell you, and they are related. The first one's not going to seem it. So a few years ago, I had the opportunity of um, going to a nice dinner and sitting next to a, a Cambridge professor. And he said, why did you want to do astrophysics? And I answered very honestly that in my teenage years, I would look up at the sky and I'd imagine the distances. So first that distance from us to the moon, if it was out on that night, and then from us to the sun or the other planets and just stepping out and stepping out and then us to our nearest star and how long it takes the light to reach us, just two years. And then further and further out. And I love that feeling. <laughs> of almost insignificance. I, I loved it, uh, I found it calming, and um, I've kind of been seeking that ever since. Now back to the night when this image was released, the one person who stayed up and watched it with me, my lovely sister-in-law, 
who's incredibly clever, incredibly talented, um, but doesn't think about the deepest, darkest depth of space that often. And this is the first time she really sat with me and I explained to her what was in this image. And I could see her feeling that sort of feeling of the distances and the size of everything. And she was really feeling it. But instead of what I felt was this kind of calm, I could see it was not quite so comforting. And she was like, at one point, Emma, like, if I'm going to sleep tonight, we have to stop now. <laughs> I'm not so comfortable with this. <laughs> So two very different responses to the to the awesomeness of the distances. Um, in in that little uh, QR code I had at the beginning, I have a, a question for you because I I would love to know how how that sort of affects you, how you feel about that. But anyway, back to this and to explain this wonderful image. This is a galaxy cluster. These white things here. These big spiky things, whenever you see this type of uh, pattern, it's usually from stars. It's not always from stars, but usually from stars within our own galaxy. So they have this shape because it's a um, hexagonal mirror and then it's got these um, narrow bits there from the struts that hold the secondary. Um, so it's just um, a very, it's a point source, we say, which is like a pinprick. Um, diffracting around the different structures of the mirror and it will always give you the same shape. So I don't really care about them. Back to the galaxy cluster. So for this galaxy cluster, we're much further away. This is taken 5.12 billion years for the light to reach us. So when the light started its journey to our telescope, the Earth had not yet been formed. And this galaxy cluster uh, it's surrounded by these weird extended objects, right? And that's not what the galaxies look like. I've asked people in, like, when I've been face to face, what do you think is going on here? Some people say rotation. And I'm like, that's, that's a really good idea. I can see where that's coming from. It's not rotation. So what's happening is that this galaxy cluster is so massive that it's bending and warping space time itself. And that's such a big sentence that I've got another one of those cute videos for you to explain it better. How is gravity like nature's magnifying glass? To find out what the universe was like in the beginning, we need to study the most distant galaxies whose light has been traveling to us for billions of years. But the farther away a galaxy is, the fainter it appears. That makes distant galaxies very hard to see, even for the most powerful telescopes, because they can only collect so much light. Fortunately, nature can provide a helping hand. According to Einstein, the gravity of massive objects can be so intense that it can warp the fabric of space-time. Light, which normally travels in a straight line through space, can show us where this distortion occurs. A very massive object will warp space and bend the path of the light. In a sense, warped space acts like a magnifying glass. A magnifying glass collects and bends light, making a light bulb, for example, appear bigger and brighter. Warped space can do the same thing to light from a galaxy. So what acts like the biggest magnifying glass in space? Galaxy clusters are the most massive things in the universe with the most gravity. When light from a very distant galaxy passes through a cluster, it is amplified and distorted, with the cluster acting like an imperfect magnifying glass. Light that would have gone in other directions gets bent toward our telescope. That lets us see the very distant galaxy in more detail. This effect is called gravitational lensing. Without this natural boost from gravity, it would be impossible for our telescopes to see far away enough in space and time to study galaxies in the early universe. The Hubble Space Telescope has made use of gravitational lensing to see many distant galaxies. And the larger James Webb Space Telescope will be able to find galaxies even fainter and farther than we've ever seen. With Webb, we will look for the very first galaxies to form and really learn about the early universe. So I think the only thing that doesn't fully explain is why things look distorted. And for that, it's because it's not a perfect lens. It's not a perfect magnifying glass. So this is showing like 
um, how not a perfect lens moving across the uh, field of view is distorting things. So it's more like looking through the bottom of a, a bottle or an old glass, you know, which is thick and mottled. So here we go. That's that's what's going on. That's what these long structures are. They are galaxies that have to be more distant than this galaxy cluster, which I told you the light when it left that cluster 5.12 billion years ago was before the Earth had formed. And I can just point some things out to you. So this one and this one, those are images of the same galaxy. And this one and this one. So, and when I ask people, I like to ask, what, what is your favourite one? Um, quite often I hear this one, I like this one. And I saw people saying it looks a bit like Dali's clock melting over the edge of the table. Um, so, yeah, incredible image, lots of physics going on there. We've got another couple of stops, though, before we finish this journey. Uh, oh, yes, before that, this is showing you uh, the comparison from Hubble to Webb on a similar exposure time. So this actually the Hubble one slightly less. So I want to be fair to Hubble, but still not that much less. Um, so you really see that Webb is able to pick out um, a lot of the details and pick out some faint objects that um, Hubble wasn't seeing. But it was fairly shallow imaging as far as Hubble is concerned. Now this, this was a, a release from a deep field uh, which didn't have any clusters in and it's from uh, what's called the Sears team. So they've released their images now. And when they first released it, they were like, it's just galaxies everywhere. That's what we're hearing from all of these first um, images, even, you know, that one with the, um, the dying star where there's a galaxy photobombing it. And so someone released this and goes, guys, there's galaxies everywhere. You're not ready for it. You can actually go on online and find the full resolution of this. So like, and actually just keep zooming in. So imagine like this is a small patch here where you zoom in and you see all of these galaxies. So just imagine what is in this whole area of space. And so here there have been some very distant galaxy candidates. I'll show you this one. This one was found by a group in Edinburgh. This is at redshift 16.6, which we sometimes use synonymously with the distance. Um, and when the light left this galaxy, well, it's a candidate, if, if it is where we think it is, uh, the universe was just 230 million years old. However, these are only candidates until we get uh, confirmation and to get confirmation, we need um, spectroscopy. So I'll just skip that slide. Uh, this is still to date the highest redshift spectroscopically confirmed candidate. So that's where we take the light, we split it up and we get a, a real distance um, estimate from it. And um, the universe was 400 million years old when the light left it. It's this little smear here, which doesn't look that impressive, <laughs> but for such a distant galaxy, I can kind of forgive them. And this is what gave them um, the confirmation that this was a high redshift galaxy. It was this specific shape that there was nothing and then we saw something. But with Webb, we can follow up these candidates incredibly quickly. And we can do that with this instrument that I'm involved with called NearSpec, which can look at hundreds of galaxies at once with this array of a quarter of a million teeny tiny shutters, each one about the width of a human hair, and they can all be open and closed independently of each other. And so you get to open the ones where there's a galaxy behind you want a spectrum of, and uh, then let the light through and then it goes to a prism or a grating and it splits up the light and this is what it looks like before we have lots of work to do to try and sort of get the data out of it. And so it's not just finding the distances but we can look for elements, uh, we get fingerprints of different elements in these type of spectra and if we only see the fingerprints of hydrogen and helium that's what's left over from the Big Bang 
then that would be really great evidence that uh, it's formed from the primordial building blocks of the Big Bang and that's our first generation of stars. So this is how we would know when we'd found it. We're not just looking for distinct candidates. We really want to know. And uh, so far, uh, there have been some very deep spectra of very distant galaxies. Um, but this one here, it had tons of different elements in it. It's got way more than just hydrogen, helium. It's got oxygen, neon. This definitely isn't a candidate for anything like that. Although this spectrum was super interesting and had many of us pondering over it um, for some months. So we're pretty much at the end of our journey with that um, high redshift candidate. I took you to the distant, <laughs> the most distant candidate that I believe in, the very edge of the universe. Um, but now I want to end kind of explaining uh, how transformative web is for understanding early uh, galaxies in the early universe. And for that, I use this analogy. So let's say I'm an alien. I'm an alien Emma and I want to learn about humans. The Hubble's view of early galaxies would be like the equivalent of taking me, alien Emma, and putting me down in a primary school playground glitchy. So the first view of humans get so much information. Uh, they can move around, they've got heads, they've got arms, they make sounds. Um, but after a while, you might just ask, you know, oh, are all humans this small? Are all humans this loud? Are they all this energetic? Are these typical humans? And the thing is that Hubble picked out galaxies in the early universe based on a very specific characteristic. Web, on the other hand, is like taking me, Alien Emma, and putting me down in a bustling metropolis. So, a diverse population of all ages. And it may be that it has put us down in a city of children and that actually Hubble had showed us all there is to see. We're still figuring that out. I thought actually this long after having the first images, I wouldn't be able to give this analogy anymore because we'd have pinned it down and we'd have said, but actually no, we're still figuring it out. We don't yet know was what Hubble had to show us everything that there was. We are finding things that Hubble couldn't see um, and we're still sort of digging in the data and trying to figure it out. Um, so with that, um, I'll end on a little flick between Hubble and Webb. Uh, so you can see how much detail you get out. There's that QR code there as well for just eight quick questions. And then, yeah, that's the end of the talk. Thank you. Well, um, thank you ever so much. That was absolutely fantastic. And um, every single time we have an astronomer or anyone that talks to us, it just completely blows my mind. And so you're going to have to deal with that in the question and answers, I'm afraid. Uh, so um, I'm looking into the Slido chat and no one has told me what time we're coming back yet. So if someone could tell me what time we're coming back, that would be very useful. Um, in the meantime, I'd like you all to just go absolutely wild in the chat, do the applause emojis, do all that sort of thing, go yay and all that sort of thing. While I look and see, we're going to come back at 8.20. Someone has just told me that. So uh, you've got time now to go and have a cup of tea, have a beer, have a wine, and whatever you want. If you want to put your shoes on in case there's an emergency and you have to leave your house quickly, someone might want to do that. In the meantime, once again, thank you so much to Emma for a fantastic talk, and we'll see you at 8.20. Thank you ever so much, everyone else. And welcome back. Hope you enjoyed your break. Hope you did everything you need to do. And we are here with Emma to ask all your questions and hopefully get all the answers. Um, the first question we're going to ask actually is a little bit of the elephant in the room kind of question. You may have noticed that when I introduced the talk, I referred to the just wonderful space telescope. Uh, so the question I'm going to ask Emma straight away, which was actually, oh, sorry, we'll also, that's the answer to another question, so we'll, we'll deal with that in a moment. Uh, the exact wording of the question I've lost, so I'm going to just ask, do you have an opinion on the naming controversy? Is there anything you'd like to say about the naming controversy? And then we can move on. Yeah. 
So it's it's called James Webb Space Telescope. It's named after a particular person. This wasn't a scientist, uh, as I understand it. He was the head of NASA at the time. Um, when uh, he was he was kind of pushing science forward as the agenda rather than sort of bureaucracy, etc. And apparently people wanted to honor this. But unfortunately, he was also the head of NASA at the time when they were actively seeking out um, gay people and firing them, which I think is uh, not necessarily an era that we want to be glorifying, which is quite, it's sad to have this um, around. It. So what I've seen some of my colleagues do, which I kind of like, is we often talk about the cosmic web. And so instead of it being JWST or the James Webb Space Telescope, it's the web telescope because it's looking at the cosmic web. And we kind of reclaim it in that way, I think, which is quite nice. That's nice. I, I, it's, it's a problem in a lot of science at the moment. We've got, we've got people that came before us that weren't exactly the people. We might want to acknowledge what they did in the science realm, but not what they've done in other parts. It's a complicated thing. Um, I think I like the idea of calling it, we're looking at the cosmic web. I, I think that's a really nice way of dealing with that. So we're going to now move on to some more, well, science-y focused questions. I think that was an important question to deal with, but let's, let's go on to some science questions now. Um, I've got a question from Anonymous, which is the simple question. What's the most exciting question you're hoping that the Webb Space Telescope can deal with, can answer for us? Mm, so I think when it all started, if we can answer that question, if we can find those first stars, etc. Probably because it's like it's the most direct test we can have of all this thing that cosmologists has been telling us about, the cosmic microwave background has been telling us about, the age of the universe and all of that. If we keep seeing galaxies further and further back, all of that theory gets a little bit more uncomfortable when you're only allowing sort of 100 million years for things to form or 50 million years for things to perform. So we can see up to around 70 million years after uh, the Big Bang. So when it all started, is that comfortable? in the theories that we have and part of me hopes it's not but you know <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna expand on that what are the questions that you hope that the telescope is going to make you not know the answers to are there is there anything out there that you, we, you know you want to know that we don't know um yeah so one of the big things is what hubble will have missed um Again, it's mostly from my area. It's like early universe, but uh, we got very comfortable with what we could see with Hubble. And then, so just finding more stuff that's out there, uh, either because it's more distant and there's more things than we would expect, or we can actually have hidden it from Hubble with dust. So it would be more dusty. Then we wouldn't know how to create that dust. Yeah. So we wouldn't know how to create those things so quickly, make them so quickly, all of those types of things. One more question that I'm going to go before I go back to the group. Uh, one thing I know, the, in fact, the only thing I know about astronomy is that every time you go to an astronomy conference, the question slash comment you always get is, have you considered dust? <laughs> is the JSWT going to end that question? Yeah, we can't get away with not considering that. Yeah, possibly, I think. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, fan favourite now asked a question. So a question from Igor in Munich. Uh, what's the limiting factor in our telescoping ability? Will the telescope twice as big give us pi r squared as much information? Nice, I like it. So... Well, I can give a, a direct answer to, to that framing of the question, no, because we can have um, big mirrors with a large field of view where we get like more information in a single image and we can get big mirrors with a small field of view and JWST is a huge mirror with a tiny, tiny, tiny field of view. We just look at this tiny part of it. So in a sense, in a single image, we don't get as much information. And then it's also about the instruments on board. So it's not just about the size of the mirror and how many photons we're collecting. So 
different ways of splitting up the light in particular are very powerful for us to get more information because, you know, for the first time now we can look and, and find out what elements there are in these galaxies, which we could never do before. I, I think it's important to note at this point that some of the diffraction gratings that split this light up were made at the greatest university in the world, Cranfield University. So it's important to know that. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, I went there. Oh, cool. <laughs> um, I have nothing to do with that. But uh, OK, uh, we have another question now from Dave J. And the question. Oh, no, question from Garnet. My apologies. Uh, how has the meteoroid damage affected the images produced? And is there going to be concern about what happens in the future with more yeah. things hitting it? That's a great question. So um, there was like, like there's been a few impacts, but there was one in particular that made it into the news, right? Because it was bigger than they had expected. I remember I was like I was driving into work and had it on the news and couldn't see what. Oh my gosh, what's happened? And um, it they couldn't have tested it on the ground because it was like, it was small, but it's at a point in space where things get accelerated really fast. So you can actually cause a lot of damage from a tiny thing. And um, it's, we're lucky because the mirrors, each individual segment, there's 18 individual segments and they can uh, be tipped and tilted independently of each other, but also the curvature itself of that mirror can be changed. So it was always designed to be focused in orbit and that means that when they had that impact, they were actually able to change the curvature of the mirror, almost like you're knocking out the dent in a car, and fix most of the deformation. How incredible is that? So there was a noticeable difference between pre-impact and post-impact, but it's it's almost, you know, it, it's negligible. We don't care scientifically. It doesn't matter. Stupid that you can do that. Like, that's out there, like further than humans will probably ever get, and yet you can just fix it yeah. from here. It's just yeah. astonishing amounts of engineering that went into this, and 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 they they were complaining that it was late. You can't complain that something's late when it can do that. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Uh, I now now have my question from Dave J. And the question is, are the techniques required to work on the JWST pictures slash data the same as on the Hubble? Or has it changed how everything is done? Are you doing the same maths? Are you doing the same physics? For the types of images that I look at, which is like the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, it's very similar. It's not changed a lot. It's more like those images of the um, Pillars of Creation We've never had that high resolution of gas emission, gas and dust emission before, the ones from MIRI. So we haven't developed the algorithms to do that. It's just been sort of smeared stuff and you can maybe get some sort of, we say a flux estimate, like how bright it is. But now you see all those features, like how do you deal with that level of information? I, I would imagine deep learning, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. That's what we do. Uh, I have a question now about, for me, about that. Um, in terms of looking at the images, in the, in, the, in the gravitational lens stuff, you say you've got a smear here, and you know that it's also the same galaxy that's smeared here, but this one looks like this, and this one does that. Yeah. How do you know they're the same galaxy? Oh, that's cool. So they make models of what the the lens is. So the lens is that galaxy cluster, and it's more than just the light we can see because it's dark matter as well. And um, they'll take some um, which uh, some of those um, objects, um, and if they look very similar in their light profiles, they might be the same thing. Um, and then when you know when you have one or two that are the same thing, that very quickly pins down the distance it has to be because you know exactly where it has to be behind the cluster. It, it refines their model and then you can find more of them. So it's pretty cool. So, so you're looking at the spectrum of the light coming off the thing here and the thing here. Is that what you're looking at? or? Yeah, we often don't have spectra, so we'll have images in different wavelengths, which is almost like the lowest resolution spectrum you can have. And then, yeah, yeah they look similar. Yeah. And, then, and then it's just trigonometry to go back to where it becomes, where it starts from. Yeah. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, actually, Igor, welcome back, uh, has another question. And so uh, actually relates quite nicely to that. When you compose the pictures, do you use data from just the one telescope or do you can you use data from lots of different sources? And um, what might complement the JWST the best? So when I, when you say those pictures, I'm guessing you mean the beautiful kind of multi composite multicolor composite. Let's mm. assume that that's what Igor means. Yeah. Okay. So um, yes, one can use multiple different um, telescopes, etc. Hubble in particular is one of the ones that's most. Um, complementary because it has really good resolution and if you were to otherwise combine, combine different ones you'd actually have to degrade what web can do otherwise you just have web and then some blurry smear you'd, 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 you'd go to the lowest common denominator yeah yeah so Hubble's one of the best and then some things like x-ray um, and then to longer wavelengths with, um, we have this awesome telescope on the ground called ALMA, which doesn't even look like a telescope that can also do quite high resolution things. Um, so yeah, we love to combine different things. So, yeah. Okay, um, and going for the hat trick, we have Igor again. Um, so did the JWST give us something unusual already? Something that has made us baffled? as the journalists love to claim we are? Um, yeah, so it has. Um, they're often like smaller than those big questions that the journalists would prefer we were baffled by. <laughs> so that um, it would be a big question. So they, I showed one spectrum that they released and it was kind of a little, um, it was put in there, I think, to gain astronomers' eyes because there was a line in there that we hadn't expected to see at all and it's it's a powerful line that we can use to, to figure out how many metals are in galaxies um and uh we know that the astronomer who was putting together that press release was just sort of like saying hey astronomers look what we found it was and trick biting you all yeah definitely and it turns out that this the fact that we're seeing this line we cannot explain from in, in one of three galaxies where we see it, we cannot explain from how we know stars form. We don't know how that line is there at the moment. So that's one example that's sort of, but there are all these sort of little ones where it's like. It's, I, I, I'm going to ask a question on, to expand on that just because I think it's important that everyone knows how this works. What's a metal? Oh, good point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For astronomers, Metal is anything heavier than hydrogen and helium. <laughs> We're very lazy. <laughs> yes. yeah. Carbon, that's a metal. Oxygen, yeah, that's a metal. metal. <laughs> Oxygen, nitrogen, metals. <laughs> yeah. well, on a related note, why do you use the, centi the centimetre grams and second system? Yeah. <laughs> Ergs. We use ergs. Have you ever heard of that? Oh yeah. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, we're gonna get that. That's getting a little bit, a little bit too nerdy. So we're gonna go on to another question that is not in any way nerdy, but is inherently depressing. So Nadia wants to know: Do you have a favourite theory of how the universe ends? Ooh, yeah. So when we think of the universe beginning as um, a explosion from a point source um, and it expanding and we now know thanks to various observations that it's accelerating its expansion so either like it just keeps expanding 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 and then everything's so far away from each other that no one you look into the sky and you can't see light from anyone else anymore because it takes too long for the light to reach you and that's sort of like a dark cold death of the universe or my favorite one which was what the question was you could imagine like you have a big crunch like somehow something brings it back in and i think probably with dark energy people suspect that wouldn't happen but i think it's the most pleasing idea right that it could come back in into a crunch and then oh what good happens after that it happens all over again and it's all cyclical yeah, yeah. That, that, that i know that would have, that would please certain uh, uh cosmologists that i know that would like to see something doing that yeah. so we don't have to have a special beginning and a special yeah. um 
Okay. Um, question here from some guy called Bremner. I don't know how they let that guy in. But there's the famous phrase uh, from someone that went to space, they should have sent a poet. Uh, are there any artists who are directly involved in the James Webb process, uh, either as a way to engage the public or as a way to just see more beauty in the universe? Or do we just trust that astronomers know what's beautiful to see? There definitely are artists um, involved in this process, like involved in putting out those images and um, helping with the public outreach side of things. Um I don't know whether they're sort of like it's it, it's like taking an artist who does art for art's sake or whether it's more like a graphic artist, if you know what I mean, because that's a very different medium than taking someone who who's doing art. So it ten, tends to be graphic artists that are doing this sort of thing, which is slightly different. But yeah. Uh, question again from Anonymous. Basically, what's next? Uh, is a telescope being planned for after the day JWST? And if we look at the graph of how long it took the JWST to get made, will that beat the heat death of the universe? Mm, there are lots of telescopes. There's some cool things coming up just in the next few years. Um, so uh, next year we're expecting this one called Euclid, which is meant to give us lots of answers about dark energy. There's also this other one, which is called... Uh, Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, which is a bit like another Hubble. So um, apparently the American military had some big telescopes and some astronomy community said, hey, could we have like one or two and put them the other way <laughs> and look out at the universe? And that's going to be able to look at really huge patches of sky. But in terms of other big, huge ones that are like really expensive, like this type of level, um, they have some crazy ideas, which are probably not past the design phase yet. So if we have um, got past that barrier of getting a mirror into space bigger than the size of the rocket, there's one on the cards called Louvois, which is 15 metres, the same sort of hexagonal tessellation of smaller mirror segments to be able to get it up there. Similar sort of um idea with the sun shield and that would be to look in uh, ultraviolet wavelengths so again you have to get above the atmosphere to be able to see the ultraviolet and that's one of the ones where it's like if it gets funding it will be decades down the line because it's such a big thing what, what would we be expecting to see in the ultraviolet though because if if infrared is useful because it sees further back in time than visible ultraviolet would have the opposite problem then wouldn't it it would see the only so it will see um, in our nearby, it sees very young stars, very energetic things. And um, as you redshift everything out that it's moving away, you'd be taking even more energetic stuff and moving it into the UV. Um, I don't know how much they would expect to pick up, but then that just means like exotic things like black holes that have um, really energetic radiation that you would pick up in the more distant universe, I think. But I haven't thought about that one so much. Is there, is there anything to be said for putting radio telescopes in space? Or is that is there no gain for that, considering we can build the, the wide arrays on our planet? I, I went to a, a fan meeting which was proposing to put one on the dark side of the moon because obviously that would be very quiet compared to us and yeah. apparently you can just send up a rocket and then harpoon some um, antenna out into a radius around it uh, but I haven't heard of anything of, of putting like satellite type things that aren't attached to a rocket thing. Okay, uh, question again this time from Garnet. Um, okay, I'm just going to read this one out because I don't understand much of it. But considering the amazing image from the EHT of the M87 black hole, will JWST be used to improve on that? Or is it not suited for that kind of imaging? And obviously, we all know what the EHT and M87 black hole are. But if you could explain for the other people that don't know. Yeah, I, I forget what EHT stands for. M87, um, 
Gosh, I forget if that's the one in the middle of our galaxy or the other one. They've they've taken two images of black holes. Do you, do you remember that orange one with a, a brighter oh, hat? The eye of Sauron thing. Yeah, and they've taken yeah. it off the uh, oh, horizon. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it won't be able to improve on exactly that type of thing. So um, the field of view, well, okay, the resolution required for that is is high. They need like a big array. Um, and uh, it's we wouldn't be able to see through there's a it, usually around black holes we have what's called a torus of uh, gas and dust so yeah okay web is meant to be able to see gas and dust but actually you can have the gas and dust that's a bit too dense for you to actually see through it so what we might be able to see um what um our structures further away which is the torus itself but the images that we were getting of from from the EHT or whatever were much closer in. It's my understanding, but also, yeah, I may be slightly wrong on that. <laughs> just, just, uh, I just remembered without any prompting at all from anyone, and nobody told me the answer. Uh, EHT is the Event Horizon Telescope. That's and it. No, yes. Nobody <laughs> told me that. I knew that <laughs> off the top of my head. <laughs> uh, question now from anonymous. Uh, are the starbursts just an annoying artifact, or is there anything in there that tells a story themselves? So I'm guessing the starbursts are those uh, sort of diffraction spikes. That I assume we... the diffraction spikes off the hexagonal yeah. structures. Yeah. Some people love studying stars. They certainly do tell themselves tell a story. Like if you, um, the, there's tons of stuff that we can learn about stars. In general, you want to look not in in the regions of dark sky that I'm looking at because we picked them to not have too many stars and therefore those just a few stars by themselves they don't tell you much in general when you're looking at stars you want to have like a big load of them you can tell their their history etc from there I think the question was more about just the actual the actual uh the, the the hexagonal bursts themselves is there anything in in the the, the lines that come off oh right is there anything well, in there yeah well I mean it's supposed to or are they just artifacts of the star themselves and there's nothing there that you won't get in the middle? Yeah, no, it's not extra information from the star. And in fact, they, they modelled it very well before they had it to so exactly what that would look like. And they kind of got it spot on. So they knew what that would look like. And that's just about the telescope. Yeah, it's a more of an effect. Okay. Uh, question again from Anonymous. Uh, in the photos, what weighs up? I think there's artistic license for that. Whichever <laughs> okay. way looks nicest. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. I don't know. Quite a really interesting question, actually, from Anonymous that came up from the chat. So thank you for coming up from this from the chat, by the way, uh, and for everyone that pointed out how to get this. Uh, is the JWST data likely to help us with the Hubble constant crisis? And again, we all know what that is, but for other people, could you tell us what the Hubble constant crisis is, please? I'm going to guess what it is, is that um, we have, like, um, the Hubble constant we measure very well from the cosmic microwave background as around 70. However, when we try and do it from different measurements locally, uh, so things that are really close to us, get something around 60 <laughs> so there's a big difference however like we have really high precision on the one that's uh, far away etc cetera, etc cetera. um so yes it will help just because it's an awesome telescope and it can go and look at the things which they they can use to measure measure it near and far um it will help with um measuring supernovae as well because supernovae is the one um sort of measure we have of dark energy so we'll be able to characterize them better etc but it's not like it's not like it would do i don't know 100 times better than another telescope at this it's just cool we've got another tool in our box to answer this and, and, hello small cat and <laughs> just 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 so i am oh, aren't you gorgeous and, <laughs> I'm, I'm being the audience now. And just so I, I understand, the Hubble constant is basically a measure of how quickly the universe is spreading out. Yeah, I haven't thought of it in that way. Probably, I would have to think about how to. Oh. I haven't thought about that. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there's an astronomer in the chat who will point out exactly how wrong I am, but I don't care. <laughs> 
It's Ed. Um, so I've got a question now from Paul, a.k.a. Pick the Cure. Uh, the Hubble has been repaired and upgraded several times. Uh, what are the implications, cost-wise and otherwise, of the fact that we can't do this with the JWST? Yes. So, I mean, there's a little story as well about this. Before launch, we had a baseline uh, timeline of five years. And that was based on, we didn't know how much propellant it was going to use to get it to a million miles away at L2. It turned out that the launch was so accurate. My cat is now scratching my screen. <laughs> um, the launch was so accurate that um, they used so little of it, and now we've got about a 20 year lifetime. What that means is that it's going to slowly degrade from things like micrometeoroid impacts to the mirror or cosmic ray impacts to their super energetic um, sort of photons that hit things and then slowly degrade detectors. Um, I, the tiny, tiny shutters from the near spec, I suspect, are not going to last it full day. So, yeah, it, it means that it's going to sort of slowly be degrading on us and we'll be sort of race, racing to use it. Um, I mean, cost, we can't spend any more on it, but <laughs> much longer than we thought we were going to. So, that's <laughs> so what, what was the original lifespan? What Five original? years they were trying to do, like, a minimum baseline. And how long did it take between built... I mean, the, 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 everyone knows... Oh, not everyone, but it, it's, a, it's a known fact in, in the sort of astronomy world that... It was the, the the time it took was continually doing like this logarithmic expansion kind of thing, yeah. exponential expansion thing. Um, so, how long are we going to get compared to how we expected that? How long would that be compared to the lifetime of the building process? <laughs> well, now we might have a comparable length of time. <laughs> Five years was going to be like a quarter of the time it yeah. takes. <laughs> Which I think a lot of astronomers would have still said worth it. But, um, yeah. Uh, I'm going to move on to a question now uh, from Vic. And I'm going to ask, am I right to believe that in an expanding universe, intergalactic travel out of the local cluster is or will become impossible? I'm assuming this is talking about expansion of the universe. You can't get from one to the other because it's expanding faster than the speed of light. I mean, I love that. I'm not, I'm not sure what the local cluster is, I guess. Like for me, that would mean the local galaxies, which, in my mind, is already we're unlikely to get into galactic travel out of our cluster, despite um, there being an expanding universe. Um, I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I assume the idea being that the local cluster is gravitationally held enough that you can get from one to the other. Um, okay, let's look a question from Sirdar. Uh, I hope that's pronounced correctly. Uh, when we're looking to the earliest times of the universe, how do we know which direction to look? Oh, great. Great question. This is a really mind-bending one yeah. that I love trying to explain. Let's see. Um, so you can look anywhere and you see into the early universe. So you don't have to look in any particular direction, but this has really mind bending consequences. So the universe has been expanding. And so obviously normally you think of things that are getting further away from us as getting like looking smaller on the sky, but there comes a certain point where what we're looking into is volume that's um, actually much smaller than it is locally, right? Because we've been expanding. <laughs> And so it gets to a point where things actually start looking bigger on the sky again. So you can look in any direction and it's like something that was much smaller in the past is smeared out on a sphere that's really centered on where we are. I know for a fact that Ed in the chat will have enjoyed that because he was telling people about how that things get bigger when they get further away. Um, I still don't believe it because it just sounds nonsense, and I, I, I only did the very smallest amount of general relativity that I could get away with at university. But yeah, that's blows my But the idea being that you can look if you want to look to the to the furthest distance of the past, you can look that way, or that way, 
or that way, or that way. Every which, direction. If every direction is towards equally far towards the end of the universe, that means that I'm the centre of the universe. <laughs> so I think people need to treat me a bit more respectfully than that. Uh, okay, we're coming towards the end of our chats now. So we've got the two. We got um, two fairly very popular questions. Firstly, what's your cat's name? Can we see your cat? We love your cat, and so forth. I'm just trying oh, to find a way I can pick up. So this is Tigger. Oh, sorry. <laughs> she doesn't love being picked up, um, but she just about. I, I spoke over the top. What's her name? Tigger. Tigger. Hello, Tigger. And if anyone who knows the shells now understands why she was shouting at me, because I think they're the most talky of all cats. <laughs> oh, the, chat, the chat loves you, Tigger. It's lovely to meet you. And finally, we've got a question from Nadia, and she'd love to know, you already read the question, <laughs> where can we get those earrings? They're fantastic. Ooh, these are on Etsy, Stepford Studio. Uh, it's a type of star. Um, I'm not going to spell it now because I'll spell it wrong without looking at it. <laughs> and in the chat, type Stepford Studio, and then people can search for that yeah. for Etsy. Yeah. Thank you. Fact, they're, they're made. They are JWST ones, and they are made by um, an ex astronomer. She she left astronomy after her PhD and started making scientifically accurate like jewelry and socks and what have you. <laughs> Leaving some science after your PhD sounds like a very good plan. Looking back, <laughs> uh, right. That's the last of our questions. So I'm going to ask everyone in the chat once again to go absolutely crazy with the emojis and the popping things and all of those nonsenses that you do and the clapping. And just thank you so much to Emma. We've had a fantastic evening. And we're going to look forward to seeing you in two weeks' time for our next talk, which I haven't got on front of me, which I believe is, no, I remember, it's the history of human emotion. So we really look forward to seeing you then. And thank you once again. And have a lovely evening. Oh, and don't forget, you can see us in the pub afterwards. There'll be uh, links in the chat for the pub afterwards. Once again, thank you so much. Have a lovely evening, everybody. Goodbye.